I'm Janine. This is KUCI 88.9 FM in Irvine, and this is Get the Funk Out. Standing by to join me is Kristen Higgins, and she's back with her new book, Pack Up the Moon, and she is a best-selling novelist of numerous other books. Kristen, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Janine. Yes, this is my 21st book. Oh I my think. gosh. Are you kidding? <laughs> when did you write your first one? I wrote my first one, um, I think it came out when I, gosh, maybe 20 years ago. So about a book a year. Amazing. Now, um, before we jump into your book, mm -hmm. have you always wanted to be a writer? I would imagine. Actually, no. Really? Um, <laughs> you know, it's a, um, I wanted to be a doctor. And so oh. I went into college fully thinking that I would become a pediatric surgeon and, um, you know, before the month was out, I had changed majors to English because there was so much math and science and I wasn't really good at it. And I thought, I'm going to kill somebody if I continue on this path. Oh my gosh. So, um, so I, uh, after college, I worked in public relations and advertising. So I was a writer, but I never thought about writing fiction until, um, my kids were little and, um, I love to tell them stories. I'd tell them stories in the car to keep them calm and, you know, mm -hmm on car trips and stuff. And um, I was a stay at home mom. My husband's a firefighter, which means he had two jobs at the time. So I was alone a lot. And I used to just start like making up stories about adults because I wanted to have some adult friends. Of course. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a lonely time when a little you're lonely. Yeah. yeah. When you're a mother of a young child and young children. And so um, I thought, um, you know, I, I, I love thinking about these scenarios and, and storylines, or if I saw a movie that I didn't really love the ending, I would reinvent the ending. And um, that's great. What a skill, you know, and I, I just thought I, it came time for me to start thinking about going back to work. And my son was in nursery school. And I thought, you know, I have till he starts all day school in first grade. I wonder if I could write a book and sell it before then. So that was um, three years away. Okay. And so I thought, I'll give it a shot, you know, and um, I read a lot. It can't be that hard. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, I wrote a book, I wrote a, a romantic comedy, because I thought that will be easy to sell. Everybody likes that, right? And, sure. uh, and I said it in a small town, because I'm from a small town. And, um, and it sold. And I have been under contract ever since. Amazing. It was like such a kick in the head because I never thought it would be a career. I never thought you could do that for a living, really, you know, unless you were Stephen King, right? Sure. Nora Roberts or, you know, Sandra Brown. Right. So um, I know all of a sudden I kind of looked up and, and years had passed and I'd written, you know, more than a dozen books. And I thought, mm -hmm. I think this is my career. You think? Um, yeah, <laughs> but I, did, you know, I didn't start it till I was 37 years old. I think that's great. You know, I feel like sometimes we get better with age. I'm, I'm sure in a lot of cases and you kind of figure out and you blend your interests and it sounds like you did that. Yeah, yeah. I, and um, I think a lot of women, um, especially mothers, do have to kind of reinvent their career if they take mm -hmm. some time out to have kids or they find that they can't balance motherhood and career, you know, so they yes. do something else. So I think it's a, you know, not an uncommon story that women often do that, make that mm -hmm. swerve. Um, and it's just, it's worked out really well. <laughs> I like really? how you call it a swerve. Usually I call it a pivot, but I think I like swerve. <laughs> <laughs> and also we need something for our mental health. We need a purpose. I always say lately, we need meaning and purpose to get out of mm -hmm. bed in the morning to, to excite us because it's mm -hmm. so hard being a parent. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's easy to get lost in, in parenthood and, mm -hmm give your whole life over to your children. But I also think it's necessary to show your kids that you are still a person separate from them with interests and, and other demands on you. And, um, and that like your life doesn't end when you have a child, you don't just become that child's servant and protector, you know, exactly. then you're yeah. a whole well-rounded person. So it was a really nice way um, for me to be able to stay at home, work, contribute to the family finances, and still be there for my kids, you know, still get them off the bus and go to the other events and all that stuff. Well, and what's also interesting too, is that 
so many people want to get published. They want to write a book and you just didn't have any huge grandiose expectation. You just went for it and it was kind of like unfolding. And then it was 12 books later, 14 books later, and here you are. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, if, if someone is an aspiring writer listening to this, I say, absolutely go for it. No one was born published, but, um, take your work very seriously and don't take yourself too seriously. You know, you're one of millions of people who would love to write a book and get it published. Um, so focus on the work and develop a thick skin because you will get rejected and, oh, yes. and you know, um, but why not? You know, if why you want not? to it, give it a try. Exactly. You know, and I, I think rejection is, can be really good actually, because it does make you swerve. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, it and it, it's important. Yeah. It makes you look at your work in a different light or, you know, you think, well, that's not what I meant, but maybe mm-hmm. that's, you know, what I, how I came across or how my work came across. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it gives you another perspective. Sometimes it's really hard um, yes. to be rejected. And I was rejected numerous times by, um, you know, dozens of agents before I got mine and, um, you know, you have to believe in yourself though. You know, you have to keep on trying and say, I put in a lot of work on this. I, I have a lot of faith that it's good. I compare myself with other authors mm-hmm. um, and I think my work stands up. So you keep moving forward. You bet. So let's jump into your new book. How did this come about? Well, um, I've been writing women's fiction for probably the last uh, eight or 10 books. I kind of grew out of romantic comedy and my books started to become a little meatier and um, had you know some more serious issues other than you know finding your person. Um, I love romance, I'm not gonna say anything bad about it, but just after writing uh, maybe 10, I started to want to get into a little more gritty aspects of life um, and all the influences that we have on us and, and some of the major life events that we have to deal with. So. I was, um, I was finishing a book here up on Cape Cod a couple of winter, winters ago, and it was freezing, freezing cold. It's February, and I was the only one on the beach with my dog, and um, the wind was blowing, and it was this you know bright, hard, brittly cold day. It's just my dog. I mean, I was only there because I had a dog, you know? And yeah. then in the distance, I see this guy, and he's standing on the shore, just looking out at the ocean, not moving, and I thought to myself, he looks like the saddest man on earth. Mm. He looked so lonely. And I have no, I mean, he could have been there, like taking a break from raising his eight children or yes, who knows. You know. <laughs> but it just struck me as it was such a, a stark and beautiful image. And I thought, I want to write that guy's story. You know, this, this guy who's all by himself. So I also wanted to write a book about dealing with the worst possible circumstances and not letting the circumstances define you and define your life. So in the story, Lauren, um, Joshua's new wife finds out she has a terminal lung disease Mm. and uh, her prognosis is three to five years. And so she has to completely reimagine the rest of her life, which will be much shorter than she wants it to be. And she goes through all those phases of denial and, sure. and grief and rage. And, <clears throat> and, um, and in the end, she thinks, you know, the rest of my life can't be about my sickness and how unfair this is. The rest of my life has to be about how lucky I've been. Yes. To have this husband, the sister, you know, the friends that I have and um, not be defined by my circumstances. Mm-hmm. And also because she's married to this, this man who is um, uh, neurodiverse, he's on the spectrum, he's um, not great at making new friends and, and social situations and he works by himself. And she thinks, you know, the last thing I ever wanted to do is break his heart and I'm going to by dying. So wow. she figures out a way to look after him after, he, after she dies. Mm-hmm. She writes him a letter for each month of the first year of his widowhood. And she has her friend drop them off. And each letter has a task for him to do. And the first one is really easy. It's go to the grocery store. 
you know, if I know you, the vegetables have all melted into one slimy vegetable and you yeah. haven't shaved or showered. So you need to go out in public and buy some groceries, you know? And so she starts kind of pushing him into the world and trying to get him to connect with other people and start to build his life without her. Sounds and, like a movie. Oh, thank you. You know, it's, it's, um, I think, you know, I say this is a love story, mm-hmm. a tragic love story with a happy ending. Yes. We know Lauren dies uh, right from the back cover copy and the, mm-hmm. you know, the first chapter, but it's, it's a story about um, taking care of your person and honoring your person and thinking I owe it to her to try mm-hmm. to keep going and, um, and that she knows her husband so well, she's gonna, you know, she's gonna still be there with him, walking him through this, this year of, of grief and confusion and heartbrokenness, you know, heartbreak. (laughs) Now this, this story came about through your loss, right? Did you base it on? You know, I, um, I have had two uh, very significant tragic losses in my life. Uh, My dad was killed by a drunk driver when I was young. So, you know, in a minute, my life changed yeah. for the worse, you know, without my dad. And, um, you know, you get to this point where you think like, okay, it's happened. Uh, now what do I do? And how do I, how do I move forward? And how do I find something not good in this, but how do I grow from this yeah. and strengthen from this? And, you know, I, I became an adult very quickly after my dad died. And I also watched my mom, who is a wonderful woman, but, you know, she could not recover from his death. You know, it was just, uh, she kind of stopped, you know, and, um, and sort of, I, I sort of became her mother and, you know, that's a heavy load. It, you know, it was a lot for, yeah. for a 23 year old. And then um, a few years later, I lost a baby, which of course is, you know, utterly heartbreaking yeah. and devastating. I'm and so sorry. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, again, I remember, um, you know, looking at uh, my, my husband, the firefighter sleeps very well just because he's so physically active and I hated going to bed after we lost our son. And um, I, because I, I would stay awake and he would fall asleep. And I remember like, going into the bathroom to cry. So I wouldn't wake him up. And I looked at my face and I didn't recognize my face in the mirror because I was so sad. And it yeah. looked like the heartache of the whole world was on mm. my face. And I thought, this can't be who I am. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't just be broken and grieving. I have to, I have to do better. And, you know, I think that when I did have my daughter and, and later my son, I, I think that I was a much better mother for knowing the grief and the loss that could have happened. So I was really grateful and appreciative. And I, I mean, I think I still am. I I think like that my children delight me every day, even though they're all grown up, you know, and I just feel so lucky to be their parent. It's something I never took for granted. So for me, grief is one of the purest forms of expressing love. You know, you only grieve the things you loved the most and and it's the sad side, the dark side of love, you know, yes. but, um, but it is pure love and everyone has to experience it. Everyone will lose someone very important to them. And so another thing I wanted to do with Pack Up the Moon was kind of create a map of how do you do it? You know, you're never going to get over this loss, Never, right? but you get stronger and better at carrying it. And um, President Biden said something so lovely um, about all those who've lost people to COVID that, you know, may their memory bring you a smile instead of tears. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's where, you know, we all have to get at a certain point because yeah. the alternative yeah. is, you know, misery yes. for the rest yeah. of your life. And most people don't choose that. I know? know it's what can we learn from these moments? Yeah. Yeah. So what are the, what are the lessons that we can apply And, you know, I was going to say, I feel like the book really can be applicable to any type of loss, any Mm -hmm. age. It's a lesson for everyone because of Mm -hmm. how much we've experienced this past year. 
Right. And, you know, it was, it was funny because I was, I had started to write the book before the pandemic and I, I'd come up to the Cape to kind of, you know, really get it into shape. And then I got stuck here, uh, you know, when everything closed down and my, my husband is a first responder, my daughter is a nurse, her fiance is a first responder. So they said, don't come home. It's not, it's safer for you to be alone. And so I was all by myself in the winter on the Cape. I didn't even have my dog with me, which was very difficult. And I was afraid of my, my kids getting sick, my husband getting sick, my mom, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, and being isolated. And in a way it really made the book very personal that, that fear of loss and um, having your life be completely different from one day to the next. So I think it is, you know, a book that even though it, it, it's of course very sad, it's about a young woman who dies too young and too soon, but it's also a very uplifting book because it shows that no matter what life throws at you, you can rise above it and carry it with you into the next phase of your life and have it kind of burnish you into your best self. Amazing. Plus, I'm thinking about you being all alone, imagining what if this were permanent? Yeah. Yeah. You know? and There's a difference between as, being alone and lonely. You know? Right. Right. And, you know, as, as a firefighter's wife, I'm always picturing being a widow. And because my mom was widowed so young, yeah. um, you know, that's sort of my paradigm. And I'm married to a man who's always putting his life in danger. So, but all of a sudden, you know, he still had to work. He didn't get to isolate, you know, he was still going on COVID calls and, you know, transporting people to the hospital and, um, and suddenly it became very real that my husband could easily catch this. And um, it's, it's kind of miraculous that he didn't, you know, he was exposed to it so many times, but yeah. 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 My daughter too, she was a brand new nurse. And what a time to be a brand new nurse. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it was, it was a very scary time. And um, yeah, it definitely is, there's a big difference between choosing to be alone and having, having isolation thrust on you. Yes. Mm. What advice would you give to people before we wrap up who are writers that, that have felt kind of lost and, you know, they, they looking for some advice on moving their writing career along. I would say um, read the best authors in your genre Mm -hmm. and let them inspire you and not depress you, you know, say like, oh, I'll never be as good as, you know, Stephen King, Um, but learn from him or her and, and think, you know, wow, I'm, this is why I'm sobbing over this page is because, you know, she really brought me into this story and this is why I'm laughing out loud. Um, So study the the greats and um and don't worry about thinking that your work isn't as good as I think that's what makes you a better writer I think having like blind confidence is probably not a great quality in a writer I agree I would say you know misery and self-doubt are why I'm a good writer because I think nothing I write is good until I really work on it and delete and revise and rewrite so, um, but don't give up hope, you know, none of us was born with a contract in our hands. So exactly. be done. Uh, I do want to mention uh, a little bit that I put your uh, information on my show blog, get the funk out And that your books have sold 4.5 million copies. Is that correct? I guess so. Whoa. <laughs> that, you know, I know it's brilliant. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I've been very lucky. And you know, that that's the thing readers give that to you. That's not something you can just put in your business plan. Exactly. You know, it's all about being able to make that emotional connection with readers. Definitely. And one thing I will note is um, what I heard you say frequently is you're an observer of life. So that man on the beach, the different things, how you're feeling, your solitude, uh, be an observer, be open mm-hmm. to the possibilities of different storylines and characters and things like that. Absolutely. Everyone has a, a life that's worth a novel, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so listen to those people. And, um, and as you say, be open to kind of soaking up their experiences and translating that to the page. Absolutely. 
give your website, please, so people can find Ooh. you. It's kristenhiggins.com and uh, all my social media links are there. And uh, yeah, be lovely to see people online. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kristen. Kristen, I really enjoyed this. Thank you, Janine. It's wonderful to be back. <laughs>